culminated in what, what VoltDB is today. Um, I promise to be very short on my piece. Uh, I'm, I'm the sales guy tonight, but I'm going to talk a little bit about how we fit from a business value standpoint. So it starts to, <coughs> starts to color a little bit of Mike's vision around the technology and really start to lay out some, some use case uh, uh, areas that would be used. And then I'm going to turn it over to uh, a guy we affectionately call Stick, but our field CTO, Ryan, Ryan Betts. Ryan will dig into the meat of the actual product and spend some time with you guys. Uh, on, on the details around the most recent product release this time. So before I bring Mike up, I thought I'd share with you a, a, a little story about Mike. So when I was looking at and thinking about uh, my next gig, which is about a year ago, I had the great opportunity to spend some time investigating Bolt and, and Mike and, and his background. If you think a guy with 40 plus years uh, uh, in the database world that's, you know, has founded and invented technology like Ingress and Postgres and Vertica, and the list goes on and on, there's about nine of them that uh, when you asked him what his claim to fame was and you started to get into the details, he talked about some of the revolutionary technology visions that he's had over the course of his career in academia and, and how pleased he is with how they culminated in literally billions of dollars of realized value, commercial value. But suffice to say, I was a little surprised actually. Mike's, uh, Mike's revelation to me was that he believes his greatest accomplishment was riding across the country on a, on a tandem bicycle with his wife. So, with that, I'd like to uh, introduce uh, my colleague and, and co-founder, Mike Stolberg. Thanks, Bruce. My pleasure. The way you can tell he's the sales guy is he's the guy with the suit. The <laughs> way you can tell I'm not the sales guy is that I'm the genius. So I want to be a little bit provocative. Ruth said that I was welcome to be as provocative as possible. And so uh, basically what you're all going to find out over the next few years is that everything you learned in school about databases is wrong. Mm. So if any of you have taken a database course in college or in graduate school, I guarantee you, I guarantee you that this is what you got taught. You got taught that uh, data lives on disk, and of course it lives in disk blocks, and blocks get brought into main memory and the main memory buffer pool, and you learned about uh, LRU caching and all that kind of stuff, and the move blocks back and forth between main memory and disk. Uh, almost certainly you got into the details of how records were actually stored on blocks that were heavily encoded. Uh, you would have learned about SQL and learned that there, that parser turns that into a parse tree and then there's an optimizer that looks at all the possible ways of doing a, do, executing that query, counting up the amount of CPU and the amount of I.O. that it thinks uh, is going to be used. And the fundamental um, fundamental operation that the query optimizer is looking at is you need a row off the disk and you do something with it. Uh, you learn a lot about indexing. These trees are omnipresent. Uh, they're clustered or unclustered. Uh, you'll, you learn that all of the big virtual vendors are using blocking, uh, so-called dynamic is locking. Uh, the gold standard that all uh, database courses teach is that you do crash recovery uh, via the right hand log. A uh, guy named Mohan has written the Bible on how to do logging, things called Aries. Uh, and that's what's taught, taught in every course I know of. Uh, invariably, you're taught about replication because people have availability. So you can do synchronous replication, and that's usually very expensive, or you can do it asynchronously, and you may lose data if things go uh, bad. And if you're, uh, in either case, chances are you're taught that designate one of your replicas as the primary, update it first, uh, write the log, uh, very style log, and then move that log over the network, roll it forward as the backup site, and that's the way to actually implement replication. So 
So that's about half of the MIT database course is taking all this stuff in relative detail. And it's also the content of every other database course I know of. And the first approximation, this describes the major commercial vendors. So unless you squint, this describes my SQL, Postgres, DB2, SQL Server, Oracle, and dot, dot, dot. And it's saying this is the focus of most uh, college level test courses. And it's the focus of essentially all the textbooks that are used in such courses. I'm here to tell you that stuff is dead. That is completely wrong. There is no redeeming social value to any of that stuff anymore. And if I want to put it charitably, that used to be the right thing to do, but it's not the right thing to do now in any vertical market I can think of. So that's what I'm going to try and convince you of tonight. And so why am I saying that it's no good? Uh, the answer is, from 100,000 feet, the database market is sort of in three pieces. So about a third of it is what's commonly called data warehouses. About a third of it is what's called OLTP, which is kind of where both is. And then a third of it is everything else. So in the data warehouse market, uh, people talk about uh, storing petabytes of data. So every time any item goes under a line, anywhere in the Walmart system. A record of who bought what went where is added to the data warehouse in Bentonville, Arkansas, and that's a multi-petabyte thing. They keep a couple of years worth of history. Every major corporation on the planet does this kind of stuff. So that's a big market uh, inhabited by the data warehouse vendors. About a third of it is OLTP, which is I have some state, I want to keep track of it, I want to update it at high, high volume, and please don't ever lose my data or corrupt it, because if you do, you will get fired. And then the everything else piece is the do, and it's sort of the NoSQL guys, it's graph databases, it's array databases. So that's basically urgies. So one slide on the data warehouse market. Uh, when there are two kinds of systems in the data warehouse market, there are column stores and there are row stores. A row store is the thing where the next thing in storage is the same record, the next attribute. That's a row store. You store data on disk record by record by record. That's the way all the traditional uh, warehouse products work. And then there's the new guys who have rotated that 90 degrees. So the next thing in storage is the next record, the same attribute. Well, the column stores are going to win. Uh, why are they going to win? They're, they're 50 to 100 times faster than row stores for a lot of technically, you know, technically uh, persuasive reasons that I don't really have time to go through. So if you're getting one hour response time for a row store, switch to a column store and you'll get, you'll get one minute response time. The performance advantage is so dramatic that column stores are just a So how are the roast, traditional row store vendors on the act? Isn't this a question of how the typical weighted average of access is in the warehouse you're not know, records, you're looking for summations of columns. Exactly. Which is why they're a factor. So why they're a factor. And for the other, if you switch the workload, they're a bad. Excellent. Absolutely. The whole reason column stores are a good idea is the workload in data warehouses is to do aggregates over columns. Exactly what you said. Workload specific. And that's why they're good. And so all the traditional vendors have one of two reactions. They're either in the process of switching from a row store to a column store. So Reclum is doing that, uh, Teradata is doing that, Tisa is doing that. So a whole bunch of vendors are, are in transition, moving from the, the wrong side of technology to the right side. 
And then there's a collection of vendors who, to the best of my knowledge, are not doing anything. And those are, include IBM, Oracle, and Microsoft. And so expect a very big megaphone from those vendors trying to convince you why you shouldn't switch and get a factor of 50. Anyway, the point to be made here is that the traditional wisdom describes gross stores. <coughs> column stores don't work anything like that. To say, I don't really have time to tell you how they work, but look up the architecture for it. Look up the architecture of HANA, the new SAP system. They talk about columns. They talk about segment reading in rows, rotating them in batch, testing the heck out of them, writing out segments to this, merging segments into longer segments to get longer and longer runs of columns. And none of that is what's in the test. So if you want to know where the, the warehouse market is going, you've got to learn about column stores and courses and books that don't teach that stuff. Okay, so I've already talked about all of this. Uh, the message is that if you're running a row store and you're in the data warehouse market, you're on the wrong side of a very compelling technology. Sooner or later, you're going you're to have to switch. And that may be painful, but the advantages to switching are so big. Okay, so now let's look at the other two markets. Uh, if you look at everything else, it's not a relational database market. It's array stores, it's graph stores, it's Hadoop, uh, and it's uh, the NoSQL guys that were the first approximation, not relational systems. It's all the textbook stuff on how to build a relational database system that doesn't apply. So to the extent that everything else, uh, there's a huge number of vendors jockeying dollars uh, to the extent that there are various winners you'll learn about them and what their technology is not covered in any of the database courses or books so that leaves us with OLTP and so OLTP is in fact a road store market but you can go wildly faster than the traditional vendors by thinking about things very differently so there are three big decisions if you're talking about OLTP. Uh, number one, are you going to worry about data that's on disk, or are you going to worry about data that's in memory? Everyone who has OLTP wants to stay up 7 times 24 times 365 times 10 years. You've got to do that by replication. What's your replication strategy? And then parallel, parallel update is everywhere in, in OLTP and how are you going to deal with the current So those are the three big things I want to talk about. But first we got to do one reality check. First reality check is that if you look at people with transaction databases, you can say, well, how big are they? <laughs> well, Facebook has a gigantic one. That's absolutely true. But most of the rest of us have not, gi not ginormous OLTP databases. And they're growing at the rate that the transaction volume goes up. For example, you don't get a database system in Amazon until you say buy it. And the number of times people say buy it is going up at the rate at which Amazon sells more stuff. Memory is getting cheaper wildly faster than Amazon's volume is going up. So if you don't fit in main memory now, wait a year or two, you probably will. So you can buy a terabyte uh, right now for less than 30K. Wait a year, and it'll be 10K. Wait another year, it'll be 5K. And you know, how much main memory can you put on a cluster of nodes, the answer is lots of people are putting 10 or more terabytes of main memory. And if you want to go fast, main memory is just obviously faster than this. So my point of view is that the vast majority 
in the OLTP market is made memory possible, at least uh, now or in the near future. If your data is in main memory and you're running MySQL or Oracle or Postgres or SQL Server or any road store, here's the basic economics of access. We actually timed uh, a system called Shore, which is, works exactly the same way that all the other road stores work, on TPCC, which is the Garden Variety Transaction Benchmark, and we said, where does all the time go if your data is in main memory? So the answer is, useful work is a very small fraction of the whole time, way under 10%. By and large, where all the time went was in four different areas. So, and you have to real, you have to know this to know how to make stuff go fast. So the first one is if you store stuff on disk, then there's a buffer pool. And getting records out of the buffer pool means you have to decode through these disk blocks because records are stored highly encoded. And that takes a fair amount of CPU time, and that's about a quarter of the overhead, which is just in buffer code. Second thing is you've got to write an very style write in wall. Whenever you update a record, you've got to write it from four images, four images into a log, and the log has to be pushed to disk before you commit the transaction. That code's about another quarter of the overhead just dealing with runtime effects of the traffic recovery. Uh, the third one is row-level locking. Every time you touch a record, you've got to set a lock. Uh, every time you update the record, you've got to update and upgrade your, your read lock and the write lock. That's another quarter of the overhead. The last one is kind of the update <coughs> for a minute. But 30 years ago, when most of these systems Written. We had one CPU, and you wanted to multi-thread that CPU because when you did a disk read, you had nothing to do until 30 milliseconds goes by, so you switch and do something else. Well, in main memory, the systems still work the same way. They're multi-threaded, and the problem you run up against is that B trees are a shared data structure. You have multiple, multiple program counters. The multiple program counters are alive in a shared data structure. You've got to have latches to keep things from getting screwed up. The lock table is a shared data structure. So you've got to latch the lock table before you can set a lock. So database systems are, or the traditional ones are full of shared state. And the shared state is all the auxiliary data structures that you've got to worry about keeping in the system. That's another quarter of the overhead. You run a multi-threaded database system and that's all the traditional DBMSs. You pay that and you have no choice in paying it. What's more, as you get more and more and more cores going after the same shared memory, Throughput is going to go to zero because they're all going to line up on the latches. All right, so this is just a reality check. All the traditional vendors are up against this. So you say, well, how do I go fast if I, have, if I want to go fast and I realize all the implications of the previous slides? If I want to go in order of magnitude faster than the elephants, I've got to get rid of all four of these sources of overheads. If I get rid of any one of them, it makes almost no difference. Because the other three pieces of the pie are still there. You've got to get rid of all four of them, or you go only marginally faster. So for, for instance, if somebody comes to you and say, I have this fantastic better thing that's better than B trees and does indexing in zero time. The trouble is that only affects useful work, which is a, such a small piece of the pie, it's not worth worrying about. You've got to worry about overhead. Okay, so 
So how do you get rid of these four pieces? <coughs> this is the key thing about making OLTP systems go fast. How do I get rid of buffer pool overhead? Get rid of the buffer pool. That's the beginning and the end of the pool. So if you don't have a buffer, run a main memory database system. If you don't run a main memory database system, you have a buffer pool and you lose right there because that piece of the pie you know, is present in your runtime. Okay. Now, if you run any one of the traditional elephants systems, they are all multi-threaded. They are all going to have a horrible problem colliding on latches on shared data structures. You've got to get rid of that. Now, if you have an elephant's code, they have to rewrite the whole thing to get rid of all of these shared data structures or rewrite it completely to be single-threaded or something else. So you're hosed unless you do something to get rid of the shared state in a, in a DBMS implementation or you run, you run single-threaded. Well, of course, both DB, we said, gee, we, we saw this <coughs> at the beginning. So we designed MultiDB, it is single-threaded. It is not a multi-threaded system because it's way too difficult to make a multi-threaded system so fast. So you, you're about to tell me what about, uh, I have uh, 32 cores that are sharing main memory. Well, we don't mind that. We take main memory and divide it into 32 independent pieces and assign each piece to its own core and run the combination of a core and main memory to single threaded. Uh, and that way, there, there are no, essentially no latches in both TV. There is no multi-threaded code. So that's that, but that's a direct consequence of using main memory. Yep. If zero latency, zero weight need for main memory, therefore you don't need for multi threaded Another way, you can give the rest of the talk if you want. <laughs> <laughs> Fundamentally, the reason for multi-threading is this way. Yes. You, you, you eliminate this way by switching to main memory storage. Therefore, there is no reason for multi-thread. Right. There is no delay. Right. Okay. So there are lots and lots of newer database systems. None of them use row-level locking because it's too expensive. So multi-version currency control is popular. Uh, there's some systems that do that. Uh, Timestamp order is popular. Deterministic ordering is popular. And I don't know anybody who's following the textbook advice, which is use dynamic row level lock. So you've got to use something else that's cheaper. And so the traditional wisdom is just plain too slow. Uh, we, we like our scheme. Uh, there are some big problems with multi version currency control that I'll tell you about in a couple of minutes. Okay, so now we'll do another reality check. Nobody who has OLTP systems is willing to go down. 30 years ago, if you had an OLTP engine, you went down and that was too bad and you tried to get back up as quickly as possible. No one's willing to take down the mine anymore. It's just too expensive. So you have to have a check. And that means you've got to have a so, how to implement replicas? Well, there are two ways to do it. The first way is they're correct. And the second way is they're wrong. So, I'm only interested in correct replicas. When I fail over, I want to fail over to, to correct data. <coughs> My favorite example is that if I have a purchase order system, and I have a replica, and I have a copy in New York and a backup in Boston, and I have exactly one widget left. So it's one in both databases. I then sell the last widget in New York, I sell it to Bruce, uh, so he thinks he's bought the last widget. But before I get a chance to sell Boston, New York crashes. So Boston thinks there's still one widget left. And so uh, my coach in New York, Sales guy 
again very soon. So he logs into Boston and he says, oh, there's one widget, he buys the widget. So you sold the last widget to two different people. And if that's an okay outcome, then you know, I'd love to, to have your profits. Uh, but most people would say, I don't want that. And if you run the eventual consistency algorithms that a bunch of vendors have, you'll end up with minus one uh, widget in both databases. And that's what eventual consistency will, will generate, which to me is creates garbage. So if you're willing to create garbage, be my guest, uh, I'm interested in, in transactional revenue. And you all sort of seem to follow Google as somehow thinking they know what they're doing. Uh, they were the big proponent of eventual consistency. Uh, the latest paper by Jeff Dean on a thing called Spanner basically says, gee, our customers actually want transactions, so we better give them to them. So I'm only interested in transactional outcomes. So how to implement high availability? There are only two ways to do it that, that I know of. The first way is primaries in New York. I write a log. I move the log over the network. And I roll forward to Boston. And I do that transactionally. And that will work. And it's done by a lot of vendors. However, that brings a piece of the pie back. And there is no way to go back. Because the minute I can bring a piece of the pie back, I'm closed. The other way to do it is to say, I'm just going to run the transaction actively at Boston and New York in parallel. And if I know that things are deterministic, which is I know that it's going to give the same outcome in both places, I just run both of them in parallel. There is no log I have to ship over the network. I'm just running the transaction twice instead of running it once and then trying to move the effect of the transaction over the network. So we do active-active. And active-active requires you to have a deterministic execution scheme because you have to give the same answer in both places. And so you have to be deterministic. And that's a big problem. Uh, with some of the concurrency controls. Isn't it also a problem when you have multiple sources of transactions and you get primary skew between the global and remote? Okay, so the order. The order has to be identical also there. The order has to be identical. So and clock-based schemes are are tricky and brittle. Yes. So we gave up on clock-based schemes and a non-clock based scheme because it's not fragile. Okay, but before I before I tell you why you have to do it this way, there's one reality check, which is what do you do if it's powerful? So I'm running on a big cluster and everything's replicated and I fail over and I fail back and everything is a cool. And then Con Edison pulls the plug. They still the power company here. Yep. So they pull the plug, and my whole cluster goes down, my whole data center goes down, all main memory goes down. Because you know it's not persistent. So if you don't have it, you know, some of you say, well, I'll handle that, I'll buy you yes system. And lots of people do that. And if you do that, uh, that's that's a good idea, but that's belt and suspenders. So no, I'm just pulling the plug out of EPS and so I have a fourth leg filter. Right. So this is long. So my feeling is that for those of you who don't have a UPS system, you've got to can't lose data on the power to. So two options. Bring back a log and write everything to disk. That brings the pie back. That's not a non-starter. The second thing is what MobileDB actually does, which is we do asynchronously, we checkpoint main memory to disk. In background, it costs three or 4% of throughput, and that produces a transactionally consistent but obsolete uh, version of the contents of main memory. We then log 
the demand that he ran, which is I you, know, you go up to McDonald's and say all the, all the number three were fries and a diet coke. We log three fries diet coke, and that's a little bitty thing rather than all the data that you actually change. So we log that and we group committed. We make sure it's saved. And so if the power goes out. Uh, there, we would store a recent checkpoint and then run the command log call. So that's the way to deal with power failures. And it turns out that uh, here's just some random experimental data. We implemented an Aries style log and here that there's this uh, asynchronous uh, checkpointing and command logging. And fan logging gives you about three times the throughput, total overall throughput, that you get from an Aries style data log. And the reason you can see this immediately is that if you write an Aries style log, that one piece of pie comes back. And the fan logging scheme is the sliver of that piece of pie. And so you bring that piece of pie back, and it just ruins your throughput. Okay, so if you're going to do active active, which I'm a huge fan of, then you've got to have deterministic ordering of your transactions. And we do. And so you can ask me or Ryan for the details of exactly how we do it, how we talk about it. However, dynamic locking does not guarantee a deterministic ordering at, at two different sites. Neither does multi-version concurrency control. So anybody who's running dynamic locking or MVCC is fundamentally up against, they can't do active-active application. They've got to do active-passive. The minute you do active-passive, you've got to write a log, and that piece of pie uh, comes back to the line. There's just no way to go things. So that then, I'm a huge fan of main memory databases. I completely agree that not all OLTT databases will fit the main memory right now. So wait a year or two. God is on my side. Uh, main memory is getting cheaper and faster than your transaction volume is going up. Deterministic concurrency control is really good because it allows you to run active active. Active active is just way cheaper than having to write a log. So you think about OLTP this way, the traditional wisdom is write a log and use dynamic lock. <coughs> and that is simply absolutely the wrong way to do things in a high performance main memory environment. The traditional wisdom says run multi-threaded, that's the wrong thing to do if you're in main memory. So OLTP is going to move strongly in this direction. And this has nothing to do with the traditional wisdom. Nothing to do with what you've learned from school. Now you're about to say, well, what about Facebook? Today it is too big to fit in main memory. Well, we've done a bunch of studies that prove that the traditional wisdom is still wrong, even if your data doesn't fit. But that gets into a longer discussion. Uh, and uh, we'll have to you know, we'll be later on this uh, topic in the future. So the summary, what we're teaching our database students is all wrong. We should be teaching them about column scores, not just based row scores. We should be teaching them about main memory OLTP and how to do replication fast and why deterministic concurrency control is good. So what we're teaching is just wrong. And if you look at the implementations from all the traditional vendors, they are all wrong. They all do dynamic blocking, they're all disk-based, and they all do very style logging. They are going to have to rewrite everything completely in order to be competitive in this coming main memory quality world. So, so basically, the implementations from the elephants not only they don't do warehouses well, they don't do OLTP well, and they certainly don't do uh, everything else well. 
So in point of fact, the vendors' codes from the elephants are all obsolete and do nothing well and deserve to get sent to the home for retired software. And so several million lines of code from every single legacy vendor are obsolete. And I expect a lot of turmoil in the market off into the future as you guys all figure this out. And because I don't expect you to believe me, I'm just trying to put the idea in your head that they're not good at anything. And what you have to realize is that if you have a high-speed oil TV system feeding a data warehouse, you can put both of those in Oracle they will run a factor of 50 slower than something else. If you put the OLT piece in something like gold, it'll run 50x faster. If you put the warehouse piece in a column store, it'll run 50x faster. The cost to you is you've got to run two systems. And I think what I see off into the future is there will be five or six or so reasonable architectures that are very good at specific vertical markets and your job is to choose the five or six and then run, use the right tool for the job, which is figure out uh, what kind of a problem you've got and run the right solution. I hear so many uh, enterprises say, my job is to stand up everything but Oracle. I'm going to run one size everywhere. Uh, that has two major disadvantages. The first one is it's a factor that should be slower at everything. And that's going to be bad. But of course, Oracle's prices are a guided tour through your wallet uh, in addition. So I see no redeeming social value to, to any of the legacy vendors' products. So with that, I hope I've made people mad. I, 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 I wasted a half an hour of your time, which is what I was supposed to do. So. Yes, and uh, the, the command log that you write, is that the synchronous write or is that that's uh, synchronous? That's a synchronous write. Because it has to be synchronous or, or we, we might lose data. But does it matter that it's small if it's a synchronous write because you're kind of block oriented? You group, you group commit hundreds of them into a big thing and do one disk write. Okay. Mike, you had a question here in the image. How do, you, how do you guarantee that the commands that you send to a replica will finish in a reasonable amount of time? The, the, well, we don't actually care because we make sure that it gets there. So now you have the command running at both places. If either of, if either of the, the commands runs into some kind of horrible something or other, then the rest of the VoltDB cluster will decide that the error node has failed and figure it out of the system, basically pretend it crashed. And so, so you you are you are declared dead, and we recover you from from live copies elsewhere. So the answer is you can run as slow as you want, and at some point we say you're dead. Hey Mike, I, I we we've got a little bit more we want to cover. We're going to bring Mike back. Uh, we've got as much time as we need at the end of this. So write them down, lock them into your memory, and we'll, we promise we'll bring Mike back for some more Mike Stonebreaker. Pardon me? <laughs> so, so, thank you, Mike. Um, I don't know. I've been uh, with Mike for about just over a year and a bit now, and, and I've heard him give that talk a few times. Uh, a few times. It just occurred to me, you know, and, and it's it's interesting. What Mike is talking about is, if you, if you really think about what he just said, forget the technical details, that it's time to rewrite the tax book. That the, the way legacy technologies have been built are obsolete, and they won't accommodate where we're going. And it's time to rewrite the tax book. Couldn't have said that. So, I think, you know, there, 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 it's, it's interesting. I'm going to spend some time talking about what Volt has built, not from the technology perspective, but some of the beliefs we have in terms of where we think the technology fits and why we think it fits well. We do not believe that we are a, a replacement. As, as you heard Mike talk about, we do not believe that we are a replacement for all things DB2 or all things Oracle or all the legacy technologies. What we do believe 
is that there's a there's a, a landscape that's emerged and it's it's here now and it's accelerating in terms of, of data and, and, and demands on the applications that are supporting that data that is never going to change. It's, it, there's no turning back and that Mike's line of, of several million lines of code that's obsolete, I think, couldn't be more true. If you believe the construct that when you look at technologies that have emerged around analyzing data, and I think we're all aware that for the past 20 years, we've been trying to figure out how do we optimize or get value from all the data that we collect. And if you think about, turn back the way back clock 10 years, um, and you think about why we started to do analytics in the first place, the reason is, is you want to get smarter. You want to make better decisions, right? So I would look at my database, I would run long running queries on it, do the analytics, and it would give me information that I, that I would then apply to my application layer and how I, how I interacted with my customers with that layer. And as time has, has, has progressed, the expectations around being able to attract that intelligence have gotten closer and closer and closer and closer to real time. As human beings, I mean, you're all out there I'm tweeting, I'm instant gratification is where we're at. And the reality is, the expectation is that you can get to as close to real time as possible. We're going to talk a lot about, about the, the concept of now. And, and our definition of now is right now, the instant that data arrives not some definition of real time that's five minutes from now, even five seconds from now, or five hours from now. The moment the data arrives. And the reality is, as you saw in that first kind of graphic, you guys all know, you don't need, you need to preach to you about the amount of data that's being created. More data created today than all of last week. More data all of last week than all of last year. The last year more since the beginning of time. It's, it's it, frankly, my client can, can envision that mind. It's staggering. So the reality is, I want to tell you a little story just to kind of tee up where Bull fits well. So imagine it's a sunny day, beautiful day like today, but you're in a residential neighborhood. I grew up in a small town in, in northern Ontario. It's tree-lined streets, cars parked on both sides. You're driving down the street, and if you're like me, you're probably late, so you're trying to figure out how the hell I get to my destination without driving like a complete lunatic. You see a ball roll out. There's two cars in front of you, two parked cars, the ball rolls out. What do you do? Well, let's see. You work back to the data, right? You act now. You see a ball, you know you've got the analytics of I'm in a I'm in a neighborhood. Typically, when balls roll out in the street, there's probably a kid playing, there's gonna be a kid coming. So you act immediately, you stop your car. Everybody in this room would do the same thing. Hammer and break, stop the car. Fair? That's a nice story, but so what? Well, what happens if it's not three data points, but three million data points coming at you every second. I'm going to spend a minute and just talk to you. You guys are all, hopefully, is there anybody from UBS in the crowd? Oh, okay. How do you do? So a couple of years ago, there was a, a, a rogue trader at UBS who, through the course of a day's trading, made a number of seemingly innocuous transactions. Small little errors. This digit was a three. It was supposed to be an eight. That decimal point was supposed to be there. Was, and there, and, and all recorded by UBS, all recorded through the day, but all of them invisible. Until, at the end of the day, when they ran those real-time analytics on their day's trading and realized, holy moly, we've got a problem. It was a $2 billion problem, the third largest trading loss in financial services history. Now, UBS has a multi-billion dollar IT budget. They record everything, they can see everything, but they couldn't flag those transactions until it was too late. Why? Because they couldn't operate it now. There's so much information they're dealing with, the billions of dollars they spend in IT every year couldn't accommodate the fact that that rogue trader made a mistake, stop that transaction from happening. They couldn't operate it now. The reality is it happens every day. That's the dirty little secret. Millions and millions of dollars are our vanquished in financial trading apps because they can't deal with now. To Mike's point, they don't understand that the Elephant software is misserving this event. And it's not until they begin to understand what's possible and you guys start to think about applications or the applicability of being able to act instantly on a lot of information, incredibly fast, that you'll be able to impact and, and, and change what's happening. So the bull world is now. Mike talked about it in, in loose terms. This was a little broader discussion. The reality is the same old technologies aren't cutting it, and they won't cut it going forward. And what do you guys to do? 
So I want you to think about a concept of, of a database universe. Mike talked about a single purpose database going away. And that the reality was his vision is, and what's playing on the marketplace today is, is clearly supporting that vision, that when you think about data, the way you want to think about that data is through optimization of business value. What you're going to do with that data, based upon the age of the data, will vary. So if you look at this graph, when you, when you look, go from left to right and you think about the age of data, the data first arrived, you want to do something with that individual data point that's very, very fast, milliseconds, but it's crazy, that road trade. You want to serve ads, enrich packets, whatever it might be, but you have to do it instantly, you have to do it now. As that data ages, and age in this case, the example I'm giving you is blink your eye and that's aging. Blink your eye and that's aging. You do different things with it. You want to calculate risk. Can I let that trader's trade go through in conjunction with the other 4,000 trades that are happening globally? That's the data element you have to be able to deal with today. And then as it ages further, and you want to do other things literally that are seconds later, you want to do single record lookup, you may want to start to think about analytics. That might be a couple of minutes old, and then you eventually want to get to uh, exploratory analytics, which might be acceptable to optimize hours later. But you have to think of data in the construct of its age. Then you lay in the value of data. Our belief is that data as a single data point, when it first arrives, is at its optimal value. So that trader, when he's making his trade, that's a single data point. I want to examine and make a decision on do I allow that to go through or not. But once that transaction has been approved, I'm going to start to do different things with it and start to think about it in different ways. I'm going to start to think about it in terms of its near neighbors, right? calculating risk. Should I let all of these trades go through? I'd allow that one to go, but does that then turn me upside down on my risk profile for that position or that equity, et cetera? So as data ages, the value of an individual data point becomes less and less. But the value of that data in its aggregate become much, much more valuable. That trade, when it happened today at 11 a.m., means nothing at 3 p.m. as a single data point or at 4 p.m. when the market closes. But when I look at all of my trades and I start to run my exploratory analytics on my case trading, that single data point, along with all of its neighbors, is hugely valuable. So age of data, and then data as a single data point, and then in, in contrast with all the data you're dealing with. Then you lay in complexity. And this is really at the, it drives at the heart of my message. When transactions were simple, slow, and simple, or excuse me, simple, slow, and small, traditional databases, relational databases could handle it. The reality is, when you add an application complexity where we're dealing with millions of transactions a second, I shouldn't move instructions, millions of data points a second, when you've got all that fast moving data, you want to deal with multiple data sources. So you've got different data types, and they're incredibly large sets. You're dealing with tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of, of data points in a second. You have to look beyond a traditional database to optimize that business value. And when you start to lay in the lens of business value around this, this construct, you start to see very clearly where technologies fit today. It's a confusing world where who we're working in. Mike talked about the fact that he believes it's going to remain confusing for some time. But when you start to look at the tech, there's great technologies out there. And when you start to put them in the context of where they can optimize business value, it lays out a very clear picture. So I want to talk a little bit specific about VoltDB. So there is no database that we are aware of that's been built in Volt. Mike talked about some of the overhead that has been eliminated from Volt. What we have built simply is unique in the marketplace today. We believe we've built the fastest commercially available database today. It allows you to handle millions. We've been benchmarked at three and a half million transactions a second. Now put that in context whether it be the two, whether it be the Oracle products, whether it be SQL, thousands versus three and a half million. We are fully asset compliant. We're transactionally consistent. So you start to think about the discipline around how Volt has been built and what that means to be able to accommodate applications that probably are failing today, that UBS trader example, or that haven't even been brought to production because they can't be supported effectively. Volt starts to change the possibilities that are there. The fact that we enable now opens the door to you to think about what's possible in ways you've never before had. So once you start to apply the potential of what can I build, 
you start to realize that anything is possible. And you start to see things emerge in the marketplace that allow you to do things that were never before capable. So we have customers that are using Volt not only to manage the large data sets and smart grids and smart meter environments, but to make buying decisions on where do I buy my external power from at that moment based upon what I'm seeing across 60 million meters that are running and, and data points that are hitting me in this second in, in the UK. And how can I optimize my profitability by using Volt to enable that capability at the application level? You start to see micro-personalization of applications where large companies realize that if they can personalize the experience, whether it be online or in person, they can impact profitability and revenue by 10 to 15, 20%. All with the ability to enable functionality of the application layer that yesterday they couldn't do, but that today Volt enables. So I appreciate your time and attention. Thank you. Um, I'm now going to turn it over to the stick. Uh, our field CTO, Ryan Betts, to talk a little bit about the details of the Volt technology. Yes, sir. Thanks. Thank How many people here are developers? Okay, right, so they're writing code for a Make products for a living. Right. All right, so I'm going to speak to you guys a little bit now. And, uh, my name is Ryan, I'm the field CTO, and I'm going to talk about what we've done for 3.0 version of Volt TV. Now, whenever you make a new version of software, you practice the clicker. Bruce, which right, right hand, the one six to the right. Hold on, let the sales guy help the technology guy. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I, I, I keep telling Bruce the difference between IT and technology, you know, software, and he's, he's, he's done to buy it. Okay, there's a bill. So when you, whenever you make a new release of software, you have to stop and think of what is really important to you and what's important to your customers. You have to listen to the feedback you're getting from the market, and you have to stay true to your vision, your product, and the product space. But Volt TV, performance is at the heart of our product, and that's where we started. We started making Volt TV 3.0. We decided that we could make an even faster database, and that's essentially what we've done. So let's look at an example of a 50-50 rewrite workflow. It's a simple, simple application. The green line here is our previous version, Volt TV 2.8, and the blue line is 3.0. Now what we managed to do here is extend the sweet spot of our high performance capability. You know, where before we were returning answers in six milliseconds, we now return answers in one millisecond, or in some cases, sub millisecond periods of time. Where before we could scale this cluster out to 150,000 transactions per second, now it will be 3.0 can scale to 200,000 transactions per second. Now this is a three node, highly available cluster with active-active replication, running 200,000 transactions per second in under five millisecond response time to the client. That's essentially the technical achievement that we managed to obtain using the ideas that Mike presented to you just now. This is essentially the implementation of that vision. So it's not just a 50-50 read workload that's important, right? And Mike is talking to you about how you can make certain technical choices essentially to optimize a read workload, you can make other choices to optimize uh, you know, a write-heavy workload. But it's been important to us in an OLTP system that we can work across a wide variety of different workload types. Right, so here's a chart that's showing for 3.0 what you can do at 90, 10 read write, all the way down to 10, 90 read write. The accomplishment here is that we have a long sweet spot, right, from workloads that are heavily write intensive to workloads that are heavily read intensive, a nice, predictable, smooth performance curve across that combination of work. So that's kind of what we've done on the performance side. Yeah, yeah, in a previous talk, Mike talks a lot about when you make a new system, you need to to figure out what your core strengths are, and you just need to leverage those, leverage those, leverage those, right? Figure out what your big bet is and leverage it. In VoltDB, one of the fundamental differences between us and other systems is that a VoltDB transaction, it doesn't block, right? It's like the honey badger of transactions. It just doesn't, it doesn't stop, right? And uh, that means, typically to us, that we use stored procedures a lot. A lot of people come to us and they say, hey, you know, I want to use VoltDB a little bit more like a traditional database, I like to do more ad hoc SQL. There's really fundamentally no reason the system can't do that, right? And so we've built that capability into VoltDB 3.0. We've improved the capability that we have to do ad hoc SQL, just conversational SQL as an operator. We've implemented some very basic uh, uh, query caching and plan caching. As a result, now we're an ad hoc SQL faster. 
this is our slope path. Right. Our slope path is now 10,000 statements per second. So, pretty proud of that accomplishment. It's not enough though to have a, a system that's highly performant. You have to be able to actually write something on it, right? And so we've worked hard to make the system friendlier to developers. We've increased the breadth of our SQL support. We've introduced JSON support. We've put a JSON document in a bar chart field that we can actually index into it using the field column function. It means that you can build primary and secondary indexes on the fields of a JSON document as part of your relational store. Yeah, and we've focused on the operational capability, right? So this is essentially the third audience that we're speaking to. We speak to the architects, we speak to the developers, and of course we speak to the operators of the database. We have increased the online capabilities of the system. We've uh, continued to work on the uh, performance impact that, for example, failure recovery has minimized that, and we continue to, to broaden the number of changes that you can make to run the system without a service with code. Additionally, We've worked through some simple kind of, this is the stuff you, know, that you sit down and write a system, you're a developer, you just get annoyed with, right? Why is this file here? Why is that file there? Just kind of the nuts and bolts thing that gets in our way. We've taken a chance to review the system, having watched a lot of people use it, and we've made some simple uh, configuration changes. We've pushed more things into the email file with more requirements of configuration. So just kind of the nuts and bolts of ergonomics of being a developer, working with full TV. It's important for people to run in the cloud, obviously, and the advantage of OpenDB being a horizontally scaled shared nothing system is that it's naturally cloud friendly. As we had customers deploy and using our you know, previous version of our transaction management system, we realized that there were mismatches in some cases between the way the system had been built and cloud capability. So at 3.0, we worked very hard on a new transaction management system. It relaxes some of the timestamp and NTP requirements of the uh, previous system. Part of the result of that is lower latency that you see on the original charts, and as a nice side effect, you end up with a system that's a lot more shared nothing, and therefore a lot more cloud friendly. Uh, finally, you know, Mike put forward the proposition that you're going to see a world where people have special purpose data stores that are specific to the problem they're solving. Right? And that's really part of our core DNA at OPB. We could that to be really, really true. We certainly don't pretend to be all things to all people. And so what we've done as part of OPB is build a high-performance extract system. Right? People come to OPB to do heavy update, heavy write workloads in real time to solve the now problem that Bruce was talking about. When they're done with that work, often that might have taken them minutes or milliseconds, they need to be able to take the combined records of that work and push it to an analytic system for long-term storage, exploratory analytics, and back testing kinds of problems. So we've built a high-performance export system that can export data out of gold as fast as we can shove data into the system. Now, I think that's actually an important point because you know, Mike was saying that a, a database, a, a, a transaction processing database, the size of the state of that database is not increasing all that rapidly, right? What is increasing is the amount of load being offered to it. And people are coming to the database with event streams, they're coming to the database with post-trading streams, they're comparing the value of those events versus essentially the state that represents the wisdom that they've extracted from their analytics stores. Right, so if, in a typical BoltDB use case, these are numbers from a real customer. They process two terabytes of data a day through BoltDB. The working state of their database is 600 gigabytes. That's replicated. So roughly 200 gigabytes of unique data replicated twice. That kind of proportion is common. Right, so the system needs to be able to maintain hundreds of hundreds of gigabytes worth of state or, or small terabytes worth of state, but it's able to process over the course of a day many terabytes of incoming events, and then it needs to be able to capture those events and push the results of those calculations out to an analytics sort of archive, and that's what our export system does. Finally, we've, we've increased the number of libraries, number of drivers that you can use to interact with the system. We've uh, improved the PHP client, improved that uh, PHP is a pretty popular language these days still. And so we've written a native PHP client that's a little more efficient than our previous version. And uh, this slide's a little out of date. It's coming soon, an updated Erlang client. In fact, our Erlang client, which was written by a uh, contributor to VoltDB, was recently benchmarked and published. It ran 877,000 transactions per second in EC2. So he's pretty proud of that. I think it's a, it's a good thing to think right in. Yeah, so, these are, some, these are just some more developer-oriented utilities that are there. I think the important thing, though, is that we sat down and we decided what is this most important 
inside of it. So, so, so in addition, in addition to the operators, the developers to use the system, when you make a new system, and you you have a lot of training to do, right? You have to teach people what the system does, how it works, how it differs, why those changes are important. We put a lot of effort into that process. We've begun a set of sample applications, and we've also started a, a bulk university system. So what this means is that you can come to the website, you can register, and you can work through a specific set of 10 different tracks that will teach you how we think about BoltDB and how to use BoltDB to solve your problems. The idea here is that you can kind of skip through the, the, the technical, you don't have to understand the system in technical depth in order to, to extract value out of it. So we put together a, a university system as well. So, so I think, you know, when we think about multi we think about, about three things. We think about what can we do to make the system even faster, right? We've spent, as a community of practice, the last 10 plus years figuring out how to archive all of our data and how to extract value from that archive. What Mike is saying, what I believe, is that we're going to spend a big chunk of the next 10 years trying to figure out how to take the opportunity, event by event, and apply the wisdom of that archive to it, piece by piece, in real time. Right? So we need to build a real-time system that scales the event streams, the data streams that are coming in, that we can use to make real-time decisions against based on what we've learned from our analytic and archive systems. That means you need speed, that's what we focus on. We think that you can write the fastest application possible, we've made it easier to do so, we provide the learning resources so that you can get started. That's effectively multi-B3.1. Is there any questions now? Yep. So uh, one thing that not, the three of us uh, are remiss to mention, so our go-to-market strategy, we, are, we have an open source offer. So a lot of what you can get access to is through the open source community up on GitHub. Uh, we have a commercial offering. Effectively, when you think about Bull, everybody in this room has the ability to go get our software to, to effectively um, analyze and handle my workload and handle the throughput and scale the way I have my application with me. When you start to think about us from a production standpoint, a lot of the, what I call yummy goodness, but a lot of the capabilities that you want to take to a production environment, replication, um, case safety, et cetera, are available in the commercial offer. So it's out there from an open source perspective for you guys to take a look at it and run it through the spaces, which most, if not all, of our customers do uh, before Mike and his team engage on a commercial relationship. So we've got Mike at the back of the room, obviously Ryan and myself. Uh, we're open to anything you want to ask us about anything that is bold. Sir? I know about you guys a year and a half ago. And the thing is, I never felt the sphere of influence from you guys as much as your competitors. Yep. Um, will you guys plan on having like an office in New York City, like support office? So, so we can question. walk in and ask questions or tutorials like that, yep. hackathons. So, so it's a great question. So I'll take that. Um, I was brought into Bolt to scale the business. Specifically, uh, the company, Mike and the, and the uh, co-founder, Scott Jar, and the technology team spent the first couple of years really building up the product and getting it ready for prime time, getting it ready to bring to you guys so that we can confidently work with you to get it into production environments. Our, our efforts to commercialize and go to market began in earnest with my arrival. The addition of people like Mike and, and Lisa on the marketing side. So we currently have offices in Boston and uh, uh, Santa Clara, California. We have partners here in New York City specifically <coughs> to support Bull and help our potential customers on the application development side and then deploy Bull. Eventually, as we grow, we don't want to get over our skis, but part of my job is fiscal responsibility to our investors. We'll, we'll start, obviously, Chicago or New York is the next market for us to start to begin to maintain a presence directly. We're not there yet, but that's absolutely in our plans. Sir? Uh, with 3 million transactions per second, is there room for distributed transactions, XA, like say, in any of this? The 3 million transaction benchmark was not using distributed transaction. It was using active-active replicated uh, single partition transactions. So if you're familiar with Bull, Mike said we split data into a set of partitions. Transactions that need to execute against just one of those partitions and all of its replicas execute very fast. Right, so the three million transactions per second were real multi-statement SQL transactions. They were fully acid, and they were actively, actively replicated within a cluster. I guess but what I'm asking is that the product support XA, or will it support it? The product supports global transactions. You can run a, a transaction against the full cluster, and uh, yes, it supports that. 
you're a handsome guy, Mike. We want you up in front of the crowd. So, so yes, sir. Yes, the support tech guy. Yes, sir. Um, I have a few questions for the tech question. So, I'll go over here. Mostly from your computer activated uh, in the valley, both for about six months. Mm -hmm. um, really high uh, performance projections, uh, about a million queries per second. And uh, some of the issues you were in, so like you talked about the paralyzed exporting. Mm -hmm. The only way you were able to do that is to maybe to export from the table. Right. Which increased the right by 2x. Mm -hmm. So, like, how does that correlate to this both 4.01 to increase a right by 2x? Because of the fact that we have right search twice into the tables. So, we once had actually. Can you restate the question? So, oh, of course. So the question is, in VoltDB, the way that the export subsystem works is we have a, another physical schema type that we call an export table. The way that that works is you just perform a SQL insert into that export table. It's essentially append only. And the data in that is actually handed off in transaction units to a streaming connector that can push the data to an external system, right? HDFS or Hadoop or, or another, another relational system downstream, right? A data warehouse. The, we used to actually, we started it when we first designed the system. We had a, a table that you could write to, and it would be both the persistent query table. All rights to that table would then be logged to the export table. But what we found in practice was that when people went to actually use that, it was very confusing to them. For example, logging an update to that table meant logging first the deletion and then the insertion, so that you could create an actual SQL replay record in order to recreate that table at an external source. The export tables within the system, they scale horizontally the same way that any partition system does. So what we've done in that case is we decided to create a system that was easier to explain, that hit the 80% use case, and that had the same scaling properties as the, as the partition and transactional system. So if you've hit a bottleneck with it, we'd love to hear from you. I'm not sure if we've worked together or not. Yeah, we have. Well, it's on camera. Yeah, definitely come back and we'll talk to you about this. So you're, you're, uh, you're asking for the impossible because you, you want a record both written locally and exported someplace else without it costing anything. No, I, I, I'm okay with it. It costs yeah. something. I just um, was curious. It actually designation is what you need two more rights. And that's really interesting. So to be clear, that all of those rights are in memory. Rights to the export table remain in buffered in memory unless the export connector is detached from the remote system. In which case that they're overflowed to does get written serially, right? So the double write is a double write to memory. Right? So you're writing two records to memory, right? That's that's not usually a problem. So it's interesting. I think if you have a detailed case, I absolutely love to talk about things like that. We can talk after. So the, the other thing, again going back to the uh, where is the transactions per second? Yeah. Was that the use case we were using it for? Was like inserts, um, which is combined you know, inserts and updates. Yeah. And um, that turned out to be, I guess, double because it's not an update. Because you have to kind of, you can't do on the UP update, right? So you have to select the existors. Right. So we don't currently support an upsearch command. Adding upsearch or SQL, uh, I like that it's on the roadmap. What I was saying is that we, do, we uh, kind of did the select and that if it existed, then the update instead of the one merge, then increase the transaction. Yeah. So I guess when you when you look at transaction counts, so you have to check if it exists or so let's see let's okay, I want to make sure that we have time to talk about more, more general questions, but I just you said something that I'm actually a little worried is gonna leave like a sense of confusion. So in multi B a statement is not a transaction. You can certainly have a single transaction and the three million benchmark that actually is multiple SQL SQL statements in each transaction. So in one one transaction you could do the select. Right, that's essentially a read from memory, function call, more or less. And then you can look at the result of that select, or the update, or the insert as necessary. Right? That's a single transaction. You can do that work, and be really clear about that. You can do that work without needing multiple transactions in the system. It's one atomic piece of work. It sounds like you have some great experiences. You, you've managed to run, this is like a relatively substantial bull workload, and maybe we can touch base to make sure. Just for your time tonight, John. Yes, sir. Um, so, uh, First of all, thanks for inviting us. Mike is one of these and all together. <laughs> but um, what's the largest disappointment that you have on both of these things? And can you talk about a few million transactions per second? A lot of times what I've found is three million transactions per second is great, but it depends what you can do in your relationships. Like, you know, if those three million transactions have some sort of warranty relationship, So there's a there's a paper that's in here in the IEEE uh, 
uh, bulletin next month that goes through this, this application in detail. And we can point you at two websites that have all the queries, you know, hardware configuration, and you know, we can muck around to your heart's content. Uh, the answer, the simple answer is that we do about one SQL command every 10 microseconds per core. And we scale, we, we tend to scale linearly unless you give us a lot of distributed transactions. And so figure <coughs> 10 microseconds per core, line up as many cores as you need to get your job. And in terms of the first part of your question, what's the largest? I believe it's, is it, is it ShopZilla with 100,000 transactions a second? Yeah, is that the largest that we got? We have customers running over 100,000 transactions per second. I believe the largest deployment is a uh, is multi terabyte income. And as an example of the entity relationship, uh, we were working on a, on a POC the other day where we took a six way join. It was taking about 55 seconds to run in a traditional uh, SQL environment. We reduced that to run in about 300 milliseconds. So, right, that was a relatively complex entity relationship, and it, the premise still holds. And just a quick follow-up, what is it working for Mike as a CDM number one? <laughs> <laughs> and number two, Mike, when you refer to those elements, I think you were referring to Microsoft, Oracle, and IBM. Not the Hadoop element, I think. No. <laughs> Ryan, the first part of the question was, what's it like working with Mike? Oh, working with Mike is, is great for two reasons. One, I, I know that it's always going to be someone a lot taller than me around, you know, so it's easy to duck and cover, you know, that's, that's number one. But I have to say, uh, humbly, that Mike is an absolutely wonderful collaborator. I think that if you look at his history and his biography, uh, he's an extremely humble person to work with, and it's really remarkable when he comes to our engineering team and essentially says, sound guys, I want to help figure something out, you know, I need some feedback. It's really a remarkable experience of collaboration, and it's something I appreciate very much. If you, if, if, I'm going to expand on that. I, I, I didn't put it on to that. <laughs> <laughs> I've never had the pleasure of working like my previous career path, and, and when we with a guy that's accomplished what he's accomplished, I was kind of lighthearted in my introduction to Mike. But the stuff that's being debated today, he thought of 10 years ago. And the reality is, what Volt is today, he was thinking about 10 years ago. And so a lot of the stuff that's in market today, that the thrashing and, and that the, I would say the mispositioning of, of some of that technologies, Mike's already examined in his career and dismissed because of a, a variety of issues. So to work with a guy with that kind of vision, it de-risks a lot of what we brought to market clearly and affords us a great advantage in the marketplace because of what's in his mind that we've been able to realize in terms of product and, and from the lower lines. So, hey. sir, the blue. So sometimes when you look at performance, security, and auditing, and authorization sort of take a back seat, can you talk a little bit about where you're at now and where you're looking to go? Yeah, at the moment when people need to do auditing, we suggest that they can write audit records to an export table. They can, that has the same transactional context as the transaction that was completed, and so it gives you a transactional uh, recording of what was done, right? We have an integrated auditing more deeply into the system than that currently. What about like access control lists and stuff like that? We perform access control by allowing access to stored procedure by users and groups, but we don't offer a secure um, authentication scheme in bulk. We offer a, a scheme based on an obfuscated shared secret. So we have we have authorization. It's, we don't pretend that the system is secure. I just want to be extremely open about this. It's, it's very important. So essentially, from authentication, we have a, a shared secret based authentication. From authorization, we do authorization based upon stored procedure. We don't do authorization based on column row or table. And in terms of uh, auditing, or the other A and AAA, we have ways that we can help people build an auditing system that's transactional in the, in the context of the work being done. Okay, but we haven't integrated that deeply into the system. Yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, we support the hiring of uh, very next order sorry, can you repeat that? I heard, I heard it. Yeah, uh, so when people come and ask me, I, I feel horrible, I'm kind of answering about these questions, that's just kind of me, I start talking if people ask me questions. So, uh, when people come and say, they have, I have a really huge performance problem, I have this problem, my, my database just won't scale, and I want to use Hibernate. 
then I know immediately why they have a performance problem. <laughs> so, in, in my experience, when you want to work at the scales that OpenB is designed to work at, if you can solve your problem with an ORM, then by all means you should. But OpenB is not designed to work with an ORM, and it's not something that we really feel is that important. We don't think that you can make that system as fast as you need to be to solve a lot of workloads that are present. Uh, what is your program to improve so, so, what are the priorities? So, so it's now prioritized. We remember that the original design principles were all in sweep, right, in scale. So, so, kind of sort procedures and, and the architecture we put in, in place. Um, we see increasing demands for a greater conversational SQL. We've got allocated budget on the development side to continue to build out kind of that dedicated uh, investment in that, and that will continue. Um, you know, happy to share uh, under NDA some of the things that are happening in the next couple of quarters if you'd like, but clearly being able to support a more conversational environment for people to be able to interact with is something that we need to do and we are doing. But there's a trade-off, remember? So performance and, and flexibility. So you're going to see as, as the ability to consume greater flexibility, it will impact performance as well. So. Sorry, I think uh, some moment, but some Yes, sir. Uh, are there encryption and um, compression features for the data? Yeah. The answer is no. <laughs> Will there be? Uh, I think in the, it, it, it is no big deal at all to, to do either of those. And you know, we're, we're basically customer driven. What our customers ask for, we do. And so people get enlarged and and using using what with what our customers want done next. And if if anybody asks for compression or encryption, we'll do it. I mean, not a big deal. Follow on comment to that question. Yeah, yeah, the, uh, the various standards people have to comply with in terms of PCI and others are basically mandated. So I would so I mean yeah, I made the observation, I'm not telling you how to do the program, but just an observation that the standards that people are banging on from an audit side of the house are making these mandatory punch lists that you have to answer or explain and nobody likes to write the explanations. Speaking of, so the data memory in multi right, the working data it is absolutely what Mike described. It's neither encrypted nor compressed. All data that we write to disk actually passes through a compression filter to the compression there is a cost for paying or to reduce I or describe specifically with encryption. And if I can complete my answer. Yes. So in that case, all of that data is already flowing through essentially a pipe or, or a streaming stack, and it would be a quite trivial thing to add a key and an encryption peer piece to that, right? So the system is designed to allow encryption, and it already includes compression of all data that rests on the disk. Yes, sir. Sure. So the question was, can we talk about get code and, and the use of fools uh, in our relationship from a funding standpoint? So get code was a strategic investor in Volt early on. Mike uh, partnered with get code to actually acquire the IP rights of Volt out of Vertica. Volt at one point was part of the the Vertica technology stack. So the get code investment allowed Mike to separate the Volt technology away from 